Anyhow, uh, you know, the Bible does says that God created things in the beginning, correct? Genesis 1, 1. And yet uh, we know that he created all living things. Then man sinned and it resulted in the fall. Wickedness increased drastically over the face of the earth. God said, enough is enough. I'm going to send a worldwide flood. And Noah built an ark. It better be a big one, right? Uh, anyhow, so that's uh, what happened. And so if there really was a flood, we should see evidence of that flood. We're going to be talking about that more next week. But the evidence we want to look at today are the billions and billions of fossils laid down by that flood. And so we're going to talk about the fossil record, compare what we see in the fossil record uh, from a creationist viewpoint and a biblical viewpoint uh, versus what we would see if evolution were actually true. But Guys, most... The famous song about billions of dead things buried in rock fires. <laughs> <laughs> Buddy <Yeah>. Davis song. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> That's a tangent. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? That summarizes your whole time. Yeah, that's right. Billions <laughs> of bed things buried in rock layers. <laughs> Lay down, down my water, water all, over all over the earth. All right. Yep. Anyhow, we're taught in school the idea of evolution. If the fossils prove evolution, correct? Almost everywhere you go. And many churches even teach that as well. And we're taught that the evolution and the fossil record takes a big bite out of the Bible. And a lot of students believe that, and they uh, then lose their confidence in the Bible. They uh, sometimes lose their uh, faith entirely. And that is so sad because the fossil record does not support evolution. It supports a creation, the fall, and the flood concept a whole lot better. So we're going to be talking about that. I used to believe very solidly in evolution and the fossil records supposedly proving evolution. That is actually a picture of me back when I was in the uh, fifth grade, I think, teaching on a Grand Junction, Colorado television program, how the study of rocks and fossils and dinosaurs all proved evolution. And so at that age, I could teach it on a television program because that is all I had ever been taught. And so if all you've been taught is evolution as a fact, what are your options? What are your options if you were growing up in the church? You see, wait a minute, evolution doesn't fit with the Bible. So what do you do? You throw out the Bible, or you throw out evolution, or find a compromise. And a lot of people have found a compromise, and they called it theistic evolution. And uh, they're too easy to compromise. And I do not believe anybody needs to compromise what the clear reading of the scripture says. I think there's another option, and that is research the evidence and find out if the fossil record really does support uh, evolution. When we did that, we found out that wasn't true. We did the research. We found a book accidentally. Mary Jo found it for five cents in a secondhand bookstore. And it was evolution. The fossils say no. Later, been updated, revised evolution. The challenge of the fossil record. Then evolution. The fossils still say no. And that was a book written by Dr. Dwayne Gish. Well, that book started us doing some thinking. And we realized, wait a minute, evolution really doesn't work whatsoever. And uh, we got a hold of everything we could possibly get a hold of on the creation evolution controversy. The problem is so many people don't do the research. They don't know there's evidence on the other side other than what evolution is uh, teaching them. And so they flounder in their faiths, give up their faith. Um, and it's so sad to see what is happening. I just want to let you know that this whole idea of evolution, I already said that in my first session, evolution is not science. It is a philosophy that is posing as science. And it's a pillar of the naturalistic worldview that everything has to be explained strictly by natural processes. And so 
we see people committed to this idea of evolution. Um, Dr. Scott Todd says, <clears throat> even if all the data point to an intelligent designer, such an hypothesis is excluded from science because it is not naturalistic. So students are being put in a box. If it doesn't have a naturalistic explanation, they can't see it. And Colossians 2.8 warns us, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy. By the way, evolution being a philosophy, don't be taken by F, captive by evolution. All right. It's, all, it's quite a few years after Darwin's book on the origin of the species, but was he wrong about the fossil record? And uh, there was one thing he was right about the fossil record. I will have to say that. He said, geology assuredly doesn't demonstrate the evolutionary theory that he's been presenting. Uh, and uh, that is perhaps the, you might say, the biggest objection to my theory. And he suggested, just keep digging. You ought to find more fossils that support the evolutionary perspective. And that's what I hear all the time at the university. Well, I know there's big problems with the fossil record, but we just haven't found enough fossils to show it. Well, guess what? We have found, and in the museums, there are over 1 billion fossils. But the problem is, there aren't the fossils to prove or to substantiate evolution. And so I'll give you three good reasons why the fossil record supports the Bible and the creation, the fall, the flood, and offers devastating evidence against Darwinian evolution. And um, so first of all, if evolution is true, you should expect to see when you dig in the rock layers, a history of the evolutionary life trapped in those layers from the fossil record. There should be all kinds of links showing how this change went from lowest life, which is supposedly cellular and simple life, all the way to all the complexity you see on the earth today. That's what you should expect to see. Uh, if um, the Bible is true, if there really was a flood and the flood preserved things that were living on the earth at the time of Noah, we find out that there wouldn't be uh, all of this um, uh, evolutionary change at all. We would see things basically like we see today, distinct kinds, we'd see some things that have gone extinct and um, so it would not be the type of change you would expect. Uh, things are kind of staying put. And because God created everything to work together, uh, even from the very get-go, you'd see complexity everywhere you look. And in the fossil record, you'd expect to find things extremely complex, even in the bottom layers, if the flood was true. And so we say that the flood is going to be a great um, way to explain the fossil record. So we're going to be looking at that today. So we'll look at the creation, the fall, and the flood model. What about this idea of complexity? Well, when you look way down there in the uh, Cabrian, you see where the arrow is pointing to those trilobites. Trilobites look simple at first glance, but when you focus in on the head of the trilobite, you find out the trilobites had extremely complex eyes. Oh my, complex eyes, wait a minute. This type of eye is extremely complex and it's in some of the lowest layers. Now they found some other type of eyes too. And they said, it looks like the eye from a recently swatted fly. Well, they found thousands of these things, these things, and they had about 3,000 lenses in them. And, uh, but it's found in the Cambrian. So people have said, oh, it can't be a fly, even though it looked like one. 
Uh, the reason is because flies supposedly hadn't evolved yet in the fossil record at that point. They wouldn't appear for another 200,000 years, but the eyes they're finding sure do look like rubber flies. And the uh, uh, quote there, you can see they have uh, reference there. Their discovery reveals that some of the earliest animals possessed very powerful vision. Similar eyes are found in many living insects, such as robber flies. Now, robber flies are so complex and very well suited for what that fly needs to use it for. Anyhow, we go to a uh, Denver museum or even a textbook, and you find out they say there was a Cambrian explosion, approximately 545 million, <clears throat> I've put in quotes, evolutionary years ago. You understand they need those millions of years of time. Creationists don't, you know. But they said there was an explosion of life and all the different body shapes and plans <clears throat> popped into existence. And my eyes popped out when I read that and I thought, oh my. <laughs> That doesn't sound like slow and gradual Darwinian evolution, does it? And so um, they've now found brains that in arthropods way down in the Cambrian as well. And guess what? When they took a, a scan of the fossil with special techniques they've been able to develop, they actually could see the brain case and they found out, whoa, wait a minute. This is extremely complex. It's just the very same brain as arthropods living today. Anyhow, oh, I love what they said here. The only way to become fossilized is first to get rapidly buried. Hmm. When we look at the fossil record, we see all kinds of mud that's really good for burying things. Where did all that mud come from? Geology, in geology, I say, a good principle is when you see mud, <laughs> think flood. Why do they have to be buried quickly? Well, otherwise hungry scavengers eat the carcass and uh, the, uh, there's a lot of decay, et cetera. So you wouldn't recognize it much as a, even what type of creature it really is. So when we look in the fossil record, what do we see? No matter where you see it, Complexity is everywhere, all over. That's very much against the evolutionary uh, pattern that we would expect to see. What about this idea of things staying put? Well, <laughs> look at what we find in the fossil record. You find a fossil shell, but we find also the very same uh, fossil. Uh, my phone is ringing in my ears here. Uh, you find the very same fossils uh, shell, and it is supposedly 53 million years old. And I say, wow, how's that work, huh? Anyhow, no change, no change going on there. Uh, sassafras leaves look the same as fossil ones over all those millions of years. Pine cones, 140 million years of supposed evolutionary history, no change whatsoever. They have found bugs frozen in amber, exactly like the uh, bugs and the mites that we find today. Dragonflies are still dragonflies, even though we see them in the fossil record, 140 million supposed evolutionary years. Insects have always been insects. We can actually recognize them when we see them in the fossil record. Sharks have been sharks. According to Denver Museum display, the first sharks evolved uh, 450 million evolutionary years ago. Then they said this, sharks have changed very little over the years. Wow, shouldn't there be some genetic drift? But we don't see it happening. They found a living shark that was actually swimming at the time. It was dying, in the process of dying. But the thing is, it's unchanged from 
what you see in the fossil record supposedly over 400 million years old. So that's a big issue. All right. Um, you find uh, fish. They're 100% fish. Vertebrates, uh, advanced eyes, blood vessels, gills, digestive muscular swimming in the lower Cambrian, way down there. Again, complexity, wherever you see it. And also, you find things are not changing very much. The coelacanth was thought to have been extinct about 65 million years ago. And guess what? When they found it off the coast of Madagascar, it was st still swimming unchanged for 420 million years. No way. There should have been some change. And uh, yep, that's what we're seeing. Stasis, not change at all. When they actually, they called that front fin a proto leg, but when they actually did the research and they animated it here a little bit, they found out that that proto leg was not used as a leg. It was used as a fin. It looks pretty fishy. Woodpeckers have been woodpeckers. You don't have to imagine a feather when you see it in the fossil record. You find them fairly complete sometimes. And bats have always been bats. They've already been found over a thousand fossil bats. Not one intermediate, not one, showing how the insectivores changed into the bats. Hummingbirds are still hummingbirds. Uh, I like this quote. The amazing thing about this fossil is that it's essentially a modern hummingbird. My mind is a little blown. Anyhow, then they say this, where the whole hovering tribe came from remains up in the air. And I like their humor, but again, shows stasis, not change. Cats have always been cats. You see that in the fossil record. Lizards have been lizard, no change. This one found in amber. And uh, we even know the species of it today. And so that's what I'm saying. Complexity everywhere. Yes. Stasis not change. Yes. And even distinct kinds. You should find one kind changing into another kind, shouldn't you? And yet you don't. But what about the textbook pictures? Hold on. The textbook shows how a salamander-like creature can turn into a mouse. And that looks good in a textbook. But the problem is they have salanders, salamanders, and they have mice, but they have nothing in between. And so that's a real problem. So those missing links that the artist makes look really good are missing. The problem is young people don't know that. And so the pictures convinces them of evolution. And then pretty soon mom and dad wonder why they no longer want to go to church. Why don't you believe the Bible? And if kids are honest enough to admit it, they've been taught you can't believe the Bible, partly because of evolution. And they think it's true because they saw the pictures in their textbook. Anyhow, here's David Kitts talking about the missing links. Evolution requires intermediate forms between species, but paleontology, the study of fossils, does not provide them. Keep in mind, this is an evolutionist writing in the magazine called Evolution. All right, David Kitts, uh, or no, Arrow White, um, is, is writing on this one. He said, but whatever ideas authorities may have on the subject, the long the fishes like that's like a coelacanth like every other major group of fishes that i know have their origins firmly based on nothing <laughs> nothing leading up to fish then he said i've often thought how little i should like to have to prove organic evolution in a court of law so he knows a lawyer would tear him apart on it stephen j gould even admitted the uh from harvard he uh he said and the extreme rarity of transitions in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. And he is an, was an ardent evolutionist, anti-creationist, but he admits that. 
evolutionary predictions for the fossils, everyone, constant change, lots of lakes, lowest life being quite simple, absolutely not. Uh, so we can say no, the fossil record gives devastating evidence against the theory of evolution. And yet what we do see in the fossil records and the living record is that the fossils and the animals show they were created after their own kind. And that's what you read in the Bible 10 different times in Genesis. God created after their own kind, not one kind changing into another kind. So every one of the predictions that we would expect for the fossil record based upon the biblical record of creation and then the flood preserving all those things giving us complexity wherever you would expect to find in the various rock layers even the rock layers themselves being laid down by the flood uh we see yes the fossil record is highly supported uh, uh by the uh, biblical model and vice versa okay you might answer, wait a minute, what about the horse series? Don't we have uh, tremendous evidence of uh, Eohippus, the modern day horse, or the uh, old time horse turning into the modern horse? We have all kinds of fossils for that, right? The answer is wrong. No, you don't have it. Um, the Eohippus isn't even a horse. Its correct scientific name is Hyracotherium. And we have living Hyracotheriums today. Uh, and in fact, there's one that lives in Israel. And you say, do you want to put a saddle on that beast? Nope. <laughs> there is a problem with the foot structure, a problem with the tooth, tooth structure as well. And uh, yet you don't hear about it. The number of pair of ribs go back and forth without any pattern. And um, big kicker for the theory of evolution is they have now found the bones of modern day horse in the very same rock layers as you would find his supposed ancestors way down deep. You can't be your own grandmother. So that's an issue for evolution. But look how good the artist makes it look in a textbook. See the number of spots? Mm, a lot of spots. Then fewer spots, then no spots. And of course, the students don't realize they're being led along by artwork to believe in evolution. Okay? Spots mean nothing. Uh, in fact, you don't even know of what color it was, do you? All right. This is out of another textbook. It shows the fish turns in, turning into the amphibian crawling out of the ocean on those proto legs right and uh, that looks good in a textbook and it convinces young people that evolution is true great artwork is the question uh, and what's the evidence is a question you want to ask okay what's the evidence that that is based upon it turned out nothing at the time this book was written but the book said missing links show how the process of evolution of course took place that was a caption on that huh how can something missing that has never been found show anything there's a real problem there all right and then you find tiktaalik um this is the latest one this is actually a new fossil that was found and they said aha this proves evolution of uh fish in the amphibians and later going on to becoming you. Now that's uh, interesting. But look at the mileage they get just by the text. Thick wrist bones. Uh, time out. They're fin bones. Why call them wrist bones? They're not attached to the vertebrae column. Why call it that? Unless you're trying to make a better case for evolution. And what about Tiktaalik? It turns out that even though all the rest of the candidates for the fish and amphibian uh, evolution has fizzled, Tiktaalik being the latest one used in a debate against Ken Ham by Bill Nye, the science guy, by the time he even used it, this would all, was already proven 
wrong. And the reason it was proven wrong is because in Poland, they have now found a trackway of creatures crisscrossing back and forth in the mud, and there were four-footed creatures. So this thing, and it was 18 million years lower in the layers than what uh, Tiktaalik was found. And so guess what? Tiktaalik has bitten the dust as well, although almost all textbooks will still have it in it. Okay, what about the whale evolution? This is a big one right now. This is out of a, a grade four, unit four lesson, government publication, but it's used in schools, etc. And it shows how that dog-like creature on the left eventually turn into a whole bunch of links eventually turn into the blue whale or the killer whales or whatever. The problem is that's great artwork, but you have to ask what's the evidence for that, okay? Well, they show you these things. They show you, well, slow and gradual adaptations over millions and millions of years can do the job. Well, you learned from Mary Jo's lesson last week that mutations working with natural selection is false. It doesn't work. Okay, well, that, look at that little guy on the left. You know, what was actually found for that? And it turns out you go to another museum, you find it, and all they found happened to be one piece of jaw. And so you have a couple of teeth. There's a piece of the jaw there. The white colored is added for your viewing enjoyment. They did not find it. And from that, they got the whole creature. That's not enough to say he's going to evolve into a whale, is it? And so artwork is what they actually use to prove evolution. It's not the actual evidence, okay? Here's Pachycetus. This is off of the front cover of Science Magazine in April of 1983. And you say, wow, look at that. There is Pachycetus. You see Oh, wow, this must be the missing link. In fact, they even said this is the best evidence they've ever found for uh, the evolution of whales. Well, that's the best evidence. What did they find? Well, we say great artwork. What's the evidence? Well, the evidence happened to be a couple pieces of a jaw and one bone at the back of the head. And that's all they had at that time. Then they made this outlandish claim that bones prove whale walked. Well, how can something without any legs, no tail, and no backbone prove it walked on land? And true, that's all they found in that, what found the one in that picture. And uh, you say, wow, that's not enough evidence. But students don't know that. They see the picture and they think, oh, this makes good sense, doesn't it? And they don't know this is all it's based upon. So your job out there is to teach others, ask that question, what's the evidence? Well, they have found more evidence now for Pachycetus. They found more of it. And they think this might be what he looked like. And so, uh, which is true, the uh, 2004 model or the 1983 model? In other words, will the real Pachycetus please stand up? You see, uh, there's not enough evidence there, is there? But the second picture, the 2004 model, is just a, mo a mammal. There's no way that you're going to get a whale out of that thing. How about Ambulocetus? You look at that and you see, the artwork, great, great artwork for these guys. Wow, what's the evidence? Well, you go to the museum, they show you the evidence, right? But what they don't tell you is they didn't find the whole skeleton, okay? Look at that whole skull that they're showing you too. And uh, say, wow, they must have it, right? The big skull showing it. And this is right out of their museum exhibit. But wait a minute. They didn't find that whole skull. They didn't find all those teeth. What they did find was portions of the skull. Notice the silver or gray color. All of the teeth you saw, they didn't find. 
this little area right here at the front of the top of the skull, that is where the blowhole would be. Guess what? They don't have a blowhole. And so how do they identify this thing as a whale? And uh, there's many things wrong with it. And they didn't find the whole skeleton. You see all the gray bones coming down here? That's added. They didn't find it. Actually, um, uh, Dr. Hans Thwaisen was interviewed. And on that interview, he admitted and that they didn't find a blowhole. And really, what they're looking at doesn't prove what they're trying to prove with it. All right, so what did they find of Ambulocetus? Oh, this much? That's not enough evidence to get that whole skeleton in the museum, is it? Or this artwork? So be careful of artwork. Rhodocetus, very same thing. Uh, they didn't find the whole skeletons at all. They only found portions of it. And in this case, only this, this much that's dark here in color. In fact, when they show Rhodocetus with uh, flippers turning into a whale fluke and the tail, etc., guess what they didn't find? They didn't find those black flippers. They didn't find the tail. They didn't find a fluke. They, they didn't find the front flippers either. And so that's not enough evidence. Great artwork. What's the evidence? Is that question students should be taught to, answer, to ask? One of the reasons that they think, oh, yeah, whales are turning, uh, evolved from uh, land animals, is because in this red circle here, you see some tiny little fragments of bones. They say, aha, that's in the right spot. These are leftover legs evolutionary vestigial legs. You heard Mary Jo talk about vestigial organs last week. Well, you have to ask the right questions. Are, could they be used for something? Are they really vestigial? Hmm. It turns out the research in 2014, uh, the researcher, this is the University of Southern California news release. And that what they did is they said, quote, a long accepted evolutionary assumption, it turned it on its head. Wow. What is it? Well, those things were not used for legs. They're not legs. They're very important for reproduction for the whales. Muscles have to have something to anchor to and uh, for giving live birth. And so that's the problem that, uh, that's been solved right there. What about the, the idea that dinosaurs took wing? Did they really, did they now find dinosaurs with feathers? You know, there's other pictures they show you like National Geographic, it shows a flying dinosaur and they show you, look at this, here is the fossil. This proves it, look at these things, these are feathers. Well, no, they're carbonaceous films and some filaments, but you have to use your imagination to see a feather. Remember the woodpecker. Look at all the feathers they found there. You can see feathers. You can easily distinguish them if they were there. Okay, so remember that picture here, a flying dinosaur. Well, this one was a hoax. A lot of people didn't know it, but this thing was put together from, I think, five different fossils, and they were finally able to prove that. And so that one bit the dust. Here's an article that actually stated that. Usually, you don't even see that when they are proven wrong. But this is uh, one of the articles that was carried, in, and it appeared in newspapers. Well, there are other ones that said, oh, well, look at this. These things, the fuzz, aha, those are feathers. No, they're not. And, uh, and so this one also turned out to be a dud. Uh, but interesting, Dr. Soares Olson from the National His Museum of Natural History, a bird expert, he saw what they were doing and putting these feathered dinosaurs in National Geographic. And he accused the magazine National Geographic, of engaging in sensationalistic 
unsubstantiated tabloid journalism. Clearly, he wrote, the magazine is not receiving competent consultation in certain scientific matters. And he's especially maddened by the society's assertion that a wide variety of dinosaurs definitely wore feathers. He said, this is just a blank. Well, how about a lie? He says, there is not one, undis not one undisputed example of a dinosaur with feathers. None. The public deserves to know this. That's Storrs Olson. Alan Fiducia, another bird expert and evolutionist as well. He said, when they put that feathered dinosaur on the cover last year, I threw 30 years worth of magazines out of my house. National Geographic journalism is a joke. The hair light filaments that company some fossils come from beneath the skin. I can duplicate the effect by skinning the tail of a modern lizard. Hmm. Alan Fiducia is well known in fossil birds, etc. He's well known in that field. Even being an evolutionist, he doesn't like what they're doing with National Geographic. Now, I would have no problem with them finding a T-Rex with a full headdress of feathers. Wouldn't that be spectacular? Yeah, it would be, but I don't want to put them on a dinosaur unless they really had them. And so we can talk about a lot of these things that have bitten the dust as well. And I want to repeat that another time. So I'm going to not mention all of that. But I do want you to understand that when they show these fossils, and here's what their wing looked like, this is imagination. It's not what they found. It's imagination. And uh, you find true birds Unfortunately, for the evolutionists, they say, well, this is the path leading to the bird evolution. But guess what they don't show you? This isn't the order they find it in. Here's the order. They find true birds where they're supposed to be. But wait a minute. Look at this. You find true birds way down even before the ancestors. Wait a minute, if dinosaurs are going to evolve into birds, you shouldn't find dinosaurs down here. And in fact, they've actually now found, and there's a big problem. Um, uh, let's put it this way. He said this, there is no problem, according to Kevin Padian, because we don't always get everything in the fossil record in perfect order. That is just smoke. That's all it is. And now they have found a dinosaur with three birds in its stomach. It's so one of them that was supposedly evolving into birds. They weren't evolving into birds. They were eating birds. And that is a major issue for uh, evolution. We're going to talk about that another time. So no, dinosaurs didn't evolve into birds. And here is that picture that I was telling you of a dinosaur with three birds in its stomach. All right. Did you know this? Fossils of modern animals, sandpipers, loons, ducks. Hey, wait a minute. Those are all birds. Flamingos, cormorants, albatross, parrots, owls. Huh. All these things, guess what? Are found in dinosaur rock layers. That's not what we were taught in school, right? We were given this geologic column, and there's no way that they were going to teach you that they have found modern birds way down here at the same time as these dinosaurs uh, or some of these other creatures as well. Unfortunately, they don't. If you were to go out and chop down a Christmas tree, and you were in what was called the uh, uh, Jurassic Forest, when the uh, dinosaurs were, guess what you'd see? You'd see the same tree as you were chopping down for your Christmas tree. So those haven't changed. That is that idea of stasis, not change whatsoever. All right. Now, here's a real problem. They are finding soft tissue 
nerves and even organs preserved in some of these very ancient fossils. Here's one, 2017 research. They're looking at this uh, salamander, hmm. but it had its meal in it too. It actually showed what it was eating. Again, soft tissue preserved over millions of years. How is that possible? Here is a list, 42 different things that were found with soft tissue. They have found soft tissue in dinosaur bone. Wait a minute, this is supposedly 140 million years old and yet they found DNA strands. They have found red blood cells. All of this perfectly preserved and now soft pliable tissue. Wait a minute, there's a big problem. Evolutionists are scrambling because of their finds because they're trying to come up with a way to explain how you can preserve the soft tissue for all of those millions of years. Now they found one particular fossil, in fact, that was supposedly way down in the Cambrian, supposedly 500 million years, and it still has soft tissue. And so that is a big problem. So these could be very important books for your family. Uh, you might give them as presents, uh, Guide to Dinosaurs, ICR put it out. Uh, Dragons or Dinosaurs, a great DVD. And we're going to be talking more about that in a future program. Did dinosaurs evolve from birds? Did, how about dragons? Are they the same as dinosaurs? We're going to be talking about that in another session here. And uh, really intriguing material. So you don't want to miss that one. Okay, there is actually a uh, younger style book. Now, I frequently do not like these little young children's books because they make it so simplistic. But this is a great book. It is simple to understand, yet it has meat in it. Enough meat, a dinosaur could feast, feast on it, right? But it has all kinds of great information. I'd highly recommend that particular book uh, for uh, anybody. Uh, so it's good for kids, but adults are liking it too. And a uh, very good book. You can get it from um, AOI uh, at uh, discovercreation.org. Okay, what about human evolution? I'm not going to get into it in much detail at all, but when you see pictures, guess what? It's artwork. That's out of the museum trying to prove that apes uh, evolved into humans. All right. Wow. Uh, here's one right out of the textbook that shows how the monkey that was swinging from the trees eventually turned into modern day man. And all oh, that looks really good. Great artwork. What's the evidence for all that? What is the evidence? Say for that guy right there. Well, it turns out all they had when that book was written was one top of a skull, not the whole skull, just the lid. And you say, whoa, wait a minute. That's not enough evidence to get this entire creature. That's true. And when young people finally see that, they are really ready to say, how can I believe what they're teaching me? So it's very important to uh, get the truth out to them. We were actually speaking, <laughs> kind of interesting, at a, a public school, Ramona, California, one time, and, um, and then another one in California, especially. And we were uh, speaking about that. We showed this picture and that picture, and they showed what was they actually found. And some kid opened up his textbook. And he said, he's right, except for one thing. They've colored the entire skull the same color. Instead of showing in dark color what was found, light color what was not found. These kids, when they found out that their textbook was deceiving them, were ready to burn textbooks that day. And you know what? We should have let them. And the reason is that would have made national news. Students in California burn textbooks because they're being led astray by artistic renditions. <laughs> Wouldn't that have been great? Um, this is a 
Nebraska man, you say, hey, great artwork. This is in the newspapers in 1922, convincing people of evolution back then. And you say, what was the evidence? Well, all they found was one tooth, one tooth, the whole tooth, but nothing but the tooth. And from that, they figured out how Mr. Ramoth, excuse me, how Mr. Nebraska man uh, looked, whether or not he used tools, who his family was, and also you see the camels in the background. That's from one tooth. Later, they found out that that tooth did not belong to Nebraska man. It belonged to Nebraska pig. And uh, basically, uh, it shows how um, a pig's tooth can make a monkey out of a man. Anyhow, um, hmm. artwork convinces people of evolution. Piltdown Man was nothing but a deliberate hoax. Uh, here's what they say they found. But the problem is every color was added to the whole thing. The teeth were filed down to make it look like it was human, or at least on the way to being human. And uh, so they put it together for a scientist to find. And sure enough, they took the bait and they came up with Piltdown Man. Problem is, Piltdown Man stood as proof for human evolution in textbooks for approximately 80 years. And it was 20, uh, 60 years after they actually realized it was a hoax. Unfortunately, once you get something into a textbook, it's hard to get it out. Oh, here's the second grade textbook used in the Grand Junction, Colorado schools. And you say, wow, this is Romanificus. A man ape was not a real man. Second graders need to ask, what's the evidence for that? Not just accept the picture. What's the evidence for that? And it turns out all they had for the evidence, <laughs> here it is, two small shreds of a jaw. And they got the whole creature. They got Mr. Romanificus on one page and they put the rest of the family on the other page. And they made the false claim that the bones of African ape men have been found in many places in Africa. Well, when this book was written, they did not have that. They didn't have any of that. Rhombopithecus now is considered nothing but an ape when they did find more evidence, nothing but an ape. But then one textbook said, well, but this ape is your ancestor. You know why? because it's an old ape and anything old's got to be in your ancestry, right? Anyhow, Lucy, here's, um, they found about 40% of a skeleton there. And uh, look at that, they found the whole skeleton almost. Well, no, not enough. But the interesting thing about it, here's Lucy, this is the museum exhibit of Lucy. Look at the Lucy's face, wow. Wait a minute, hold on. You don't have enough evidence to figure out what the face is. All right. Uh, how about the hands? Wait a minute. No hands were found. Hmm. The feet are shown here. Wait a minute. They didn't find any feet. So you understand this is artwork being applied to the fossils, right? And they think, well, we know the creature walked upright because you look at the knee joint. Dr. Johansson said that at one time, but when questioned, he said, well, the knee joint uh, hmm, wasn't all found together. And in fact, the knee joint was found, the actual knee joint that they used for up to indicate upright uh, walking, the knee joint was found approximately two kilometers, two, let's say two to three miles, be closer, two to three miles away from the rest of the skeleton. Well, so much for Lucy. And by the way, the, they now have a skull for Lucy, but it was not found with the rest of the skeleton either. It was pieced together, all right? And in fact, they call it a family legacy for Lucy, but it looks like an ape skull. The, um, it's interesting, the French Science Journal says the apes of the species Australopithecus, which is Lucy and friends, did not represent the origin of man. They should be removed from the relevant family tree. We would agree. And uh, so when we see that, we say, wow, this is what the scientists are starting to say. And the Norwegian and the uh, uh, scientists have said, wait a minute. 
the birth canal of Lucy is not large enough for Lucy to ever have given birth. Therefore, Lucy is not a she, it's a he. And that would put this one into an entirely different species. And so, so much for Lucy. Uh, are they really making composite? Are they putting things together from distant places? The answer is yes. And this was right out of the textbook. Tim White made this reconstruction of an afarensis skull, that's Lucy and friends, using parts of not one, not two, but several individuals. The section of the back of the skull is the crushed cranium mentioned. It contains 107 separate pieces. And they didn't find the whole skull together. So why do they put it together? Well, they're using evolutionary bias in order to do it. This is right out of Time Magazine. And it's talking about some scraps of bone. But then they say this toe bone proves the creature walked on two legs. And they get that from a certain bevel right there. Said, aha. But the problem is the toe bone was not found with the scraps of the skull. And in fact, uh, Dr. Johansson, who pieced together Lucy and actually pieced together the knee joint with the rest of it, he said this. He's dubious about categorizing the 5.2 million year old toe bone with the rest of the fossils. Why? because it's separated in time by several hundred thousands of years. And uh, it is found 10 miles away from the skull fragments. <laughs> Again, watch out for these composites to giving you so much information. Ida was proposed in 2009. 2009, okay. Guess what year 2009 was? It was the year that they wanted to celebrate what would have been Charles Darwin's 200th birthday. So right before his birthday, they introduced this fossil saying, aha, we found the missing link. They had textbook supplements already written, DVDs, museum unveilings to happen at the precise right time to celebrate Darwin's birthday. And they did all of this without ever letting any of the evolutionary even experts see the evidence. When they actually saw it, when this actually came out, they were saying, you don't do science that way. Even the evolutionists were saying that. And then others said, you know, um, it is nothing but a lemur. And we have fossil lemurs. We have living lemurs unchanged from the fossil record. You haven't found anything. The, the uh, people that were actually promoting it says this will be in textbooks for a hundred years. And my mind is devious. And I thought, why only a hundred years if it's true? Hmm. Is that how long they think it was going to take for it to be uh, exposed? Well, it turned out it only took five months. And in five months, Ida was considered no longer part of our tree. And in the same year, Artie was introduced. Now, in October of that year, we were talking February uh, earlier for, uh, uh, for the other one, uh, uh, for Ida. But in October of that year, right before November, would have been the 150th anniversary of Charles Darwin's famous book on the origin of species. And they introduced RD as one of the links. So they're really proud of it. And what they failed to tell you in most cases is that they didn't find whole bones. They had powder to work with. They didn't find whole skeletons as they showed in many textbook pictures. They only had pieces and fragments, et cetera. When I saw this picture of Artie, I said, my, what long arms you have, Artie. What would that tell me? Knuckle walking ape, probably. Anyhow, and so it's interesting. How can you put together powder? And they agreed it was more like putting together powder than bones. You're going to make it look like anything you want. Notice the various colors in this skull right here. I hope that 
didn't get covered. Uh, okay, we'll go back to it. Um, why do different colors? Well, they didn't find all the pieces together. In fact, it was distributed over a big area, and you fee see that they are pieced together from not one, not two, not several, but 32 individuals pieced together to make Artie. And I say, boy, you can make a lot of big mistakes when you do that. And by the way, you look at the jaw, it's ape-like. You look at so many other features, ape. It's not a half ape, half man at all. So when a new thing comes along, like one of the newer ones in September was homo malady. You ask, uh, what's the evidence? But in, maybe you don't have the evidence. But what you end up doing, you should say, wait and see. Let's find out in a few years what they say about this particular creature. And it didn't take long, in almost a year to two years. And they're saying, wait a minute, uh, these weren't buried in that cave. They weren't, these were washed in. In fact, uh, huh, what washed it in? What, why were the bones broken all in the same places? Uh, why were they, looked like somebody was looking for bone marl, which is called a delicacy in many areas. And, uh, and so all of a sudden there were many things saying, this was hunted, not the hunter. And so, this one probably is biting the dust. Uh, so wait and see, okay? Too many crushed skull fragments. Why? Well, many people groups ate, ate monkey brains. Did you know that? And so that's why they would do that. Um, and then it's drastically younger than originally thought as well. And this sediment transport causing mixing. So the wait and see is a very important thing. If you want to hear more about some of the latest finds on human evolution, get this book right here. And it's a book by uh, Christopher Rupi and Dr. John Sanford. Remember, Dr. John Sanford is heavily credentialed. And they wrote this book giving you detailed information about so many of the supposed links from ape to man. So have they found the links from ape to man? Nope. What they have found were monkeys. Yeah, various apes. And they found man. The only thing in between is a lot of artistic imagination. If you want to know more, also another great book with all kinds of pictures is uh, Dr. John Morse's book, Writing with Frank Sherwin, called The Fossil Record. And uh, if you did nothing but read, look at the pictures, read the captions, you will get the point of the book. But if you want the details, read it. It's there. And the details are easy to understand in this one. So I'd highly recommend this particular book for sure. And you can get that from the AOI offices as well. So the next time you see a new face on the block, you say, great artwork, right? Then you ask, what's the evidence? But other questions you might ask, is the skull that they are showing me, is it a composite? Were all the pieces found together? And these, when they find out, these were not found together at all. These are all composite skulls. So you can make that look like whatever you want. So make sure you ask that question and then you get your young people that in your circle of influence to ask that question. Hopefully, you do that so they're not taken captive through the philosophy of evolution. So what do the fossils indicate? Yes, we see complexity everywhere you look. You don't find the links that evolution would produce, would expect, do you? And you find things are staying put. All of this, what you see here, would indicate, and the rock layers that they're found in, have tremendous evidence that they were, they were put down by a catastrophic flood. When you see mud that actually buries these fossils and sometimes even rapidly burying these fossils, like this guy eating his lunch, when both of them got trapped, when you see mud, think flood. And I think you'd be right in virtually all these cases. Next week, we're going to give you geologic and archaeologic 
evidence as well as cultural evidence that the flood was a reality, okay? All of these observations from the fossil record today that I've given you support nicely the biblical record of the creation with the fall, of course, and the flood.